Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Strangeology Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jeff, and this is a show where we explore the world of weird, the strange, the unexplained, from cryptids and creatures to UFOs and aliens, forbidden history, the paranormal, and more. So it's been a a wild month so far for August. We started off with Cryptid Bash, of course, and I did a little recap minisode the other week after I returned. That was about all I had in me after that trip. Uh, and it was it was an awesome time. So next year, if you're in the area, definitely check it out. So today's episode is a new interview, which I think you're really going to like. And uh, before we get into that, let's just go over a couple quick updates here. Uh, the past couple of weeks have just been a total whirlwind dealing with the heat dog days of summer, if you will, and uh, of course travel and and uh, we're getting uh, our kiddo ready for school and uh, some exciting news on that front. Uh, now is as good a time as any to announce that uh, kiddo number two is on the way due at the end of the year. <laughs> so growing family here at Strangeology HQ. Uh, so just as a uh, an early heads up, uh, my schedule closer to the end of the year and beginning of 2023 is, of course, going to be pretty hectic for a bit until we settle into a routine uh, with the uh, the new little one. And uh, I probably won't be recording any new episodes for uh, a few weeks to maybe like a month. Uh, we'll see. I'm going to try to record some stuff ahead of time, I think. Uh, but with the holidays and everything in between, it always gets a little tricky (laughs) to get anything done that time of year, uh, minus like new babies and all that stuff. So we'll see, stay tuned on that front, but definitely really excited, uh, about all that. Um, anyway, uh, in other news, I have the Sasquatch Calling Festival in Whitehall, New York, coming up for my next event. Uh, it's going to be Saturday, September 24th, and I'm really stoked to be vending at that. I wanted to do it last year, but things didn't really work out with timing, and I've heard it's a really awesome event to go to, much less uh, vend at. So if you're in the area, definitely come by, say hello. Uh, I'll be slinging my cryptid shirts, of course, along with uh, all the other merch that I carry. I usually bring uh, some enamel pins. I've got poster prints. Um, I've got these one inch uh, uh, buttons that I only sell at events. I don't sell those on my shop online. Uh, and, uh, what else do I have? I don't know. I'm always adding, (laughs) always adding things. Uh, and the event goes from 11 AM to 6 PM. So definitely be there if you are in the area. And at the end of the day, they've got this fun, it's the Sasquatch calling festival. So at the end of the day, they get a bunch of people that come up, uh, and they do their best like Bigfoot call. (laughs) And I'm really excited to check that out. In other news, uh, I just dropped a brand new video on my YouTube channel, which if you haven't subscribed over there and checked things out yet, I would super appreciate it if you did. I usually leave a link in my bio for that, uh, but basically it's a, uh, a compilation of creepy humanoid encounter stories that definitely <laughs> freaked me out a bit when reading them. So I thought it would be cool to do a video kind of talking about those tales and involving like pale crawler types and uh, invisible terrestrial entity slash glimmerman type creatures. Uh, And of course, you know, uh, you take this, the stories with a grain of salt, but I'm hoping to do more videos like that in the future uh, and to build up my, my content library over on my YouTube channel as well, beyond posting uh, the podcast there. And I do have a few other, you know, shorter form videos and 
Uh, I do post my uh, my short form uh, content that I've been doing for for TikTok onto YouTube as well. So it's all out there, <laughs> and that's uh, that's pretty much it for updates. I don't think there's uh, too much weird news going on in the past week or so. And uh, I don't have any new merch designs ready just yet to uh, announce, but there's some new stuff in the works. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. And uh, so why don't we just get into the episode? So I had the chance to have an awesome conversation with Alex Petikoff, who runs with the Small Town Monsters and Chasing Legends crews, and he helps them out with... Uh, filming and investigating and he does his own stuff too uh he has his own business pedagogue media and uh goes out looking for bigfoot cryptids i think you're really gonna like this one and uh, it's probably my favorite interview i've done so far so alex is a really down-to-earth kind of guy he has a wealth of knowledge a lot of cool stories so sit back relax grab a snack a drink whatever <laughs> and Enjoy the ride. All right. Welcome back to the show, everyone. On this episode, I have the pleasure of having Alex Petikov on to chat all about Sasquatch, cryptids, and more. Alex is a filmmaker, outdoorsman, adventurer, and spends his spare time out in the field boots on the ground, searching for Sasquatch and other cryptids and documenting it all. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, how are you doing, man? Good. Thanks for having me on, man. A lot of fun to uh, talk about these topics. I thoroughly enjoy discussing a lot of different aspects. So I'm really excited to uh, have a chance to chat with you. Yeah, yeah. I've been I've been wanting to have you on the show <laughs> for a while. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what you do. <laughs> I know my, my intro is a little extensive, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, if there's anything yeah, no, else no, I, I missed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, simply put, I'm a guy who runs around the woods with uh, gear looking for Sasquatch. No, that's obviously kind of <laughs> the simplified version. No. Um, so I'm a filmmaker adventurer, uh, basically over the past year and a half, almost two years now, we've been uh, specifically doing a series called Bigfoot beyond the trail uh, for small town monsters which is a, a boots on the ground kind of investigative documentary docu series on YouTube, which looks at all aspects of the Sasquatch phenomena in the sense of geographically, there's a lot of different locations we've been to and go to. Uh, and our idea is sort of, you know, we, we try to take folks along for the ride visually really try to document these locations, uh, share some of the stories. Oftentimes we interview eyewitnesses or local researchers, you know, we'll go to a place that, we're not familiar with. We're not just going to assume we know everything about that environment. We want to talk to local researchers, maybe local biologists, folks that are really more boots on the ground. You know, we're kind of visitors, but you know, whatever we can find along the way, we like to showcase that. And we truly believe in uh, keeping it authentic and not fabricating or adding any added drama or anything like that. We get into a lot of drama on our own and it's, trust me, none, none of it is by choosing most of the time. Some of the crazy stuff that happens to us it's not, it's not something we put in there for dramatic effect. It's uh, just what happens when you're out there spending extended times in some of the most remote places of uh, North America. Yeah, sure. For sure. Um, yeah, I was recently um, uh, checking out some of your work a, a while ago. I watched the, uh, you did a film that was, uh, you were like way up in Northern New Hampshire, I think, but there was another one where you went out to Bluff Creek Right. And uh, there was just some <laughs> I don't know if it was gag reel, but you just like totally ate it like on the trail. <laughs> like <laughs> there was like a pit or yeah. something. It's like, yeah, that's real stuff right there. That was hiking. <laughs> that was actually hiking down to the Patterson Gimlin film site. Yeah. And the trail narrows out and you're walking through these ferns. And I just happened to fall right off the trail. And Eli Watson is coming up behind me to try and help me. And he ends up slipping, too, while he's filming. Oh, geez. Same kind of spot. So it's just, you know. That's the thing when you're out in these areas, oftentimes even a sprained ankle, that can be a dangerous situation. I mean, you just, you're yeah. putting yourself in these situations where so many things can go wrong. That's where the pre the preparedness kind of comes into play because you're not only dealing with wildlife. I mean, that's probably what most people are scared of, but just sure. the simple remoteness, the terrain and weather is usually the two biggest factors that ends up why so many people go missing and die in, in wilderness areas. And yeah. then of course, other people that's for me is usually the biggest threat out there is 
the possibility of other th- people. And we've run into some very strange characters out there. I'll tell you that yeah. uh, it's not exactly fun to run across some people doing weird stuff out in the woods. We'll put yeah. That yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. People who, who, uh, are out there for a reason. They don't want to be bothered yeah. by society. They're <laughs> so not definitely. innocent squatchers like us that are just out <laughs> yeah. there to enjoy the woods. <laughs> yeah, definitely leave those people alone. <laughs> um, that's awesome. So you recently went up to Alaska for an STM project, right? Can you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So that was uh, probably one of the most intense to date um, kind of shoots we've done. Essentially, This was kind of unique because we do these things every once in a while, usually with Beyond the Trail. It's myself and Eli or some of our buddies that are kind of part of the Beyond the Trail extended universe. I don't know what what we're calling it these days, but (laughs) people like Tate Hieronymus of the Bluff Creek Project and Ron Reed, Jonathan Easley. There's a lot of other folks that kind of are involved and and we love bringing in other researchers. Um, But oftentimes we'll do sometimes these crossovers with the rest of the STM crew. So Seth Breedlove and... Heather Mosier and some of the other folks. So we've done that in Washington before where they would be filming a project simultaneously to us filming a project. So we kind of put them out. You can watch on the trail of Bigfoot, the discovery, and then watch our companion piece on YouTube. And they kind of feed off each other, but they're also independent. So that, that with Alaska, uh, we all set out there and this was the longest shoot basically in small town monsters history. It was like almost three weeks that we were up there. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) And it was so, yeah. So essentially myself and Eli and Ron Reed, our friend went up there to a property in Alaska that uh, the property owner had been, I've been in contact with him for a while. He's had a long history of strange activity out there, a completely remote area. Yeah. And we're talking an hour plus boat ride from the nearest small town on, on coastal Alaska. So wow. one of the, uh, to, for me, one of the most remote places I've ever been in my life. I mean, and we've been to some of the top most remote places in the lower 48 but alaska is just a different story yeah so, it's it's so big out there there could <laughs> it's expa- it's there beyond be expansive anything yeah yes and there's- yeah, really there's a lot of crazy stories and so yeah. we went up, we went up to this cabin and our, for our first eight days we were at this cabin no cell service nothing and seth and the rest of the crew were actually in other parts of alaska interviewing eyewitnesses so they were doing the on the trail of bigfoot kind of film series where that's more less investigative i i guess when compared to our our projects but more about the lore of bigfoot in alaska yeah and interviews with eyewitnesses so we're doing these projects in tandem we spent that those first eight days out of this property then we meet up with them up near denali national park in interior yeah. alaska and we kind of filmed with them and then you know we filmed part of the stuff for on the trail of bigfoot and as well as our own project which is actually our first alaska video that's actually out on youtube but um the cabin one i think is probably we can talk more about that because that was really interesting so yeah. I, mean, I, I can go into more detail if you'd like because i think that one's going to be pretty exciting yeah let's go man i want to hear it <laughs> sure so essentially um you know back in uh early 2021 i believe it was or no was it early 2020 yeah i think it was early 2021 I was contacted by a gentleman who has a property up there in Alaska, remote fishing cabin, basically middle of nowhere, uh, incredible location. And he had said that they, over the past few years of owning that location, he's had a lot of very strange activity going on. Yeah, I mean, r- roars coming from the woods, hearing, you know, wood knock sounds, power knocks, things thrown at the cabin, boat. Uh, they were, they'd be moored out in a boat a hundred plus feet into the bay and having rocks actually thrown from shore into that boat um, and making that entire distance, which Holy is, moly. <laughs> I, I don't know. There's not many people that could make that shot having seen, you know, kind of the distance that would require very strange things going missing. I mean, one of the stories they had was an ax that went missing. Um, essentially one summer it was there and then it was gone and they, they kind of thought, Oh, somebody misplaced it, whatever by the next year they'd already gotten a new one and replaced it and then they come back and that same axe is now leaned up against the side of the cabin as if it had never really gone missing but oh, it's been wow. gone for over a year it's <laughs> mischievous stuff i mean uh but the sounds and the audio they recorded out there uh he sent that to me and it absolutely blew my mind i mean it was some of the and i, I can't say it's sasquatch of course i mean with a lot of this yeah. stuff there's you know there's a possibility that something else of course, but to me, it was some of the most compelling audio I've ever heard, period, with this subject. I mean, we're talking about vocalizations and noises and, and one particular that sounds like a baby crying. 
Um, and that that sound is something that they recorded on that property only when women have been present. Wow. Um, which <laughs> is really crazy because they're Alaskan uh, native stories, you know, from the First Nations people that live there. Um, and, you know, there's been uh, books written about this and that have, you know, covered the, those people have told their stories to, you know, authors and other folks documenting this topic about how, you know, they used to warn their people, don't go into the woods if you hear a baby crying. Um, yeah. And that, yeah. that's a, you hear that in other places, not just coastal Alaska, but I know there's a rich kind of uh, tribal history in, in coastal Alaska. And when I, when I say, when I'm talking about this area, by the way, this would be the Kenai Peninsula, which is an extremely rugged part of Alaska. And it is part of the temperate rainforest chain that stretches from basically that Alaskan coastal area down to Southeast Alaska, all through British Columbia and down to the redwoods of Northern California and everything in between. Right. So yeah. that is the area that has some of the most rich history of Sasquatch sightings between Northern California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, and Alaska. I mean, some of the most incredible contiguous habitat probably in the world, the right. temperate rainforest. So that's the area that this cabin is located in. And again, just the remoteness alone was was pretty wild. So the, the audio really surprised me. And I got to know the property owner. Um, and we talked a lot and, and we kind of finally made a date where he'd been wanting us to come out there earlier. And, and we well, we obviously were, were really wanting to get out as soon as possible in May of this past year, <clears throat> 2022, was when we finally got to go out there and yeah. spent full eight full days essentially out there off the grid, no connectivity to the rest of the world. I mean, you have to make calls via sat phone out there. <laughs> totally <laughs> wild. Incredible. Yeah, totally disconnected from civilization and like that whole area is like the the Kenai Peninsula is kind of like near the infamous Alaskan Triangle too isn't it yeah there's a story of that that I mean that stretches into interior Alaska as well but yeah a lot of people probably will know the Kenai Peninsula in terms of the Bigfoot topic from the stories of Port Chatham right uh, the that's the the Alaskan killer kind of Bigfoot sort of stuff. There's, I mean, there's, there's, you know, shows and documentaries been done about it. There's some good documentaries out there. The show, I mean, I don't know. I, <laughs> it, it's a TV show, I'll put it that way. But uh, right. one of the authors uh, or one of the guys who's investigated that case pretty heavily, Larry Beans Baxter, who's a former law enforcement, he's up there um, in Alaska. And uh, he wrote a really good book about it, about the history of Port Chatham. I have it laying around somewhere and he kind of dives into it and, and essentially it was a town that was a, they, they claimed was aban abandoned because of the Nantinok, Bigfoot-like creatures. Right. When in reality, it seems like the, the town was most likely abandoned for unrelated economic reasons. I mean, you had small fishing towns. Actually, this near this property that we were at, there used to be a little community there that just went extinct like yeah. 70, 80 years ago because the you know, the economic viability of the fishing and all the stuff that those communities were, were bringing in just wasn't there. So a lot of these towns just dried up. Same yeah. thing with, with Port Chatham, but uh, there, there, there were allegedly Bigfoot like or hairy man like creatures being seen around town. And somehow that got conflated into them killing people. And then that is what the, why the town was abandoned. And that's the premise a lot of uh, people will go with. But if you look in, if you peel back the layers, it's, more convoluted than that, which is usually the case. I mean, the most spectacular yeah. stories are usually not, are usually an exaggeration of kind of what actually went on. But um, right. <laughs> so that's what, that's probably where people hear of the Kenai Peninsula. I mean, we had so many people asking us, oh, are you guys going to Port Chatham? Or is that the place you're going to? And I was like, no, I mean, I think that's been done enough. We're going to a completely unique location that uh, to me had just so much credibility. And um, a lot of the people that have experienced stuff there were, uh, you know, experienced outdoorsmen, lifelong Alaskans, uh, people from pretty credentialed backgrounds that none of them said that it was Bigfoot or they're Bigfoot believers. They just said, how the heck do we explain a lot of this? Yeah, stuff? there's something it's weird going on and there's <laughs> a bear is not going to throw a 20 pound rock 100 feet out into a lake and hit <laughs> hit a boat <laughs> that's uh that's something else for sure yeah so yeah. i mean and we we experienced some pretty interesting stuff out there and i i can't say 100 percent it was a sasquatch of course i mean until i see i have not seen a sasquatch i you know i don't have definitive evidence we just have things that have happened most of the time you're out there nothing usually happens when you're out big footing but occasionally you'll get something interesting that happens and i kind of put that in my interesting pile that we can discuss and kind of talk about the backstory 
what led up to a certain event happening? You know, did we document any kind of evidence, whether it be audio or uh, physical or uh, eyewitness testimony, anything like that? So it's not definitely Bigfoot, and I don't like to mislead audiences and say, oh, every sound we hear out there is Bigfoot. And, you know, there's enough people doing that. We, we really yeah. are trying to uh, bring a credibility to the subject and just say, hey, man, you know, a lot of times you're out there, you're just having fun. There's nothing wrong with not taking yourself too seriously out in the woods. Like you mentioned with that gag reel. I mean, we kind of, <laughs> yeah. we have fun, but at the same time, we try to get, we try to be, uh, you know, uh, critical thinkers when it comes to this topic and, and realize there is unfortunately a lot of um, bogus stuff out there. So the more we can get rid of that, the more we can talk about the interesting things that actually are um, going on. Yeah, no. And that's, that's a great way to approach it for sure. Um, I, <laughs> I appreciate appreciate that uh, appreciate that because that's like uh, there's there's so much you know garbage that you have to sift through to to see what's real and what's a hoax and yeah it's uh, unfortunately <laughs> the way the way things are with this kind of thing yeah you know? I mean it, I I think it's like that with any with almost any topic especially yeah. when you throw the, the internet into it I mean anyone can write hey this is what Bigfoot behavior is like and post on the internet and that gets repeated enough times that it sort of becomes a mainstay. So, I mean, it's like with any topic you're into, I mean, you're not just going to go, you know, buy something from the store that you you don't know about. You want to do some research, you spend a lot of money on something or whatever, do your research. That's, that's all I'm telling people think for yourselves. Don't just let people dictate things to you and, and be skeptical. I mean, yeah. law, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence or, you know, some sort of an explanation. Don't, you know, don't trust me with what I'm telling you. Just, you know, make up your own mind. I'm not trying to convince you that, hey, this is definitely what we, this was definitely a Sasquatch we encountered. It's just, hey, this was interesting. I mean, you make up your own mind. It's up to you. We all have a sort of a, a free will to sort of um, formulate our own opinion. So I think that's uh, just important with this, uh, with this topic and all kinds of Freudian topics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, like you get to work with Seth and the gang from Small Town Monsters. How did you uh, how did you get connected with them? Yeah, it's a good question. I've I've known Seth now. I mean, oh gosh, it's been since at least 2015 or so. We've been um, we've been buddies since then. I I, I was uh, I did a short documentary called Mystery at Loch Ness back in 2015. Um, once I'd gotten out of school, I was traveling a little bit and I was over in Scotland and I, of course, went to Loch Ness. I'd always been interested in the cryptids and and that those topics from a young age. So going yeah. to Loch Ness, of course, was like a big pilgrimage kind of thing. Right. So I went there, did a short documentary, put it up on YouTube. You know, I was just like, oh, you know, there's a lot of people. I grew up watching a lot of these documentaries and great shows about Bigfoot and cryptids, you know, whether it be In Search Of or Animal X, Monster Quest, a lot of the classic <laughs> programs, right? Sure. That a lot of people would be familiar with. And uh, essentially I said, hey, why don't I start making my own kind of spin on stuff like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot? So I, I put out this Loch Ness documentary and I, you know, I got an email from a guy named Seth Breedlove. And he's like, oh, hey, I really liked your film. I'd like to show it at our Minerva Monster Day event. And um, STM had just really started then. It was essentially they had just put out basically one film. And I think they were working on the Whitehall Bigfoot film at the time. Oh, yeah, that so it was sounds like about right. <laughs> super in its infancy. And they, they hosted this Minerva Monster Day event down in um, in Minerva, Ohio. And I was I, I actually took a road trip down to Point Pleasant to the Mothman Festival. That was my first event you know, nice. ever with this sort of topic, <laughs> which is a, gr a great one to start on because holy moly, that was incredible. I got to meet. People I had, uh, you know, been fans of for a while. People like Ken Gearhart, Lauren Coleman, um, Nick Redfern, I'll oh, just lots of other folks. Yeah. So it was just a great, great time. We had a good, good time with it. But um, and then I went up to the Minerva Monster Day, hit it off with Seth. Um, actually, I met Seth at the Mothman Festival. I should say that's that's technically where we met. But he, we were, you know, scheduled to be at the Minerva Day. So we kind of took our time getting up there. Went to Salt Fork in Ohio and all this stuff. And cool. Yeah, just. Uh, <laughs> Hit it off with Seth. We had a kind of similar approach and the topics we, we liked with cryptids and STM just started covering a lot of stuff. And he was like, hey, man, I really want you to start working with us. And um, he let me do a series called On the Trail of Champ, of course, which is about the Lake Champlain monster. And I know you're from Vermont. So yeah, yeah. You'll know actually, about Champ. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about that. Um, you're very much into Champ. Yes, uh, which yeah. is like my backyard. I, I, I grew up about half an hour from Burlington uh, in this small town, but you'd always 
when I was growing up, you'd hear like someone who lived in uh, like Colchester or Charlotte yeah. and they're like, yeah, like my my dad's buddy was out on on the lake and and something brushed up against his fishing boat. So like you'd hear like a person that you knew, like a friend of a friend of a friend <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> or whatever that may have had an encounter. Um, yeah, that was that was wild. And um, yeah, it, I, I've, I've watched your 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 documentary is it it really good. Um, like, do you, what do you think champ is? Do you think it's like this plesiosaur type creature or is it just a sturgeon or like <laughs> what's what are your thoughts on that? It's a good question. I mean, I often I, I kind of every every so often I think in my head, you know, what is going on with this champ thing? Because I, I have different opinions depending on the season. Now I have been haven't really been over to the lake in quite a while. I love going over to Lake Champlain. And I mean, actually going, it was sort of funny when I was growing up, even though I was in New Hampshire, I was only a few hours away from Lake Champlain. I think I'd only been like once. And um, oh, I was more interested in Loch Ness than I was in Lake Champlain, which was way closer than the other one. So yep. <laughs> the first time I really dove into the Lake Champlain topic was, uh, you know, when I did on the Trail of Champ, and that was in 2017. That was summer of 2017. I filmed it into 2018 it came out early 2018 and um it was just so interesting seeing that lake and learning so much about it it's ancient history and how yeah. big it is i mean people don't understand this is one of the largest lakes in north america i mean sure it's nothing compared to the great lakes but you know compared to average lakes i mean it is 120 oh, yeah. plus miles long 12 miles wide at the widest almost 400 plus feet deep with underwater caves i mean there's above ground caves from the time it was part of the Champlain Sea. So right, I thought yeah. it was really interesting, the ecology, how much more viable it seemed for something large to be living in than Loch Ness. I mean, you just had more fish species, more biodiversity in the lake, um, just a lot going on there and just the history of sightings. I mean, such an interesting history of sightings. Now, again, I don't know, my opinions kind of change about what it is. I don't really know. I've never really I, I was kind of skeptical of the, the plesiosaur sort of thing. I mean, that just seemed to make the least amount of sense to me. Uh huh. But I yeah. thought, what, you know, what could it possibly be? Heard some pretty intriguing theories about it being a possibly large turtle like creature. Hmm. Had multiple eyewitnesses say it looked like a giant turtle with an elongated neck. Yeah. Um, so that was really interesting. Uh, the, the supposed Baudet footage, which is still kind of under lock and key. I, one of the people who was privy to see it basically said it was a, you know, turtle-like creature and this was actually a, the same i a same person who had a, a witnessed a champ creature and described it as a gigantic turtle yeah um with an elongated neck turtles can kind of move their neck around and i think that would make more sense than something plesiosaur like i mean a turtle is something that you could only have a, a few of these you know things and they could live for a very long time yes, I mean, yes there's massive snapping turtles in the lake and obviously snapping turtles are a lot smaller than <laughs> what's being purported with champ but even the size wise you know, people think of a lake monster, they think, oh, how could something like that so large stay hidden? They think in 35, 40 to 50 feet long. I mean, that's ridiculous. Most of the sightings are actually 10 to 15, 20 is on the long side. And that's, I mean, 10 to 15 feet, that's in the in territory of a lot of large alligators and crocodiles and great white sharks, which that they're huge, don't get me wrong, but yeah. those are not, you know, gigantic prehistoric megalodon sized creatures. They're, they're, you know, you see, we saw 10, 12 foot long gators in Florida this past winter while out in the Everglades looking for the skunk ape. Oh, and <laughs> when you see these things, they, they're huge. And, and most of it is tail. Yeah. So the body, right. the body section is maybe only, you know, five, six feet long and you've got the rest of its tail. So when I, you think about that and kind of the, the history of the champ sightings, I don't know. And the ancient history of the lake, how there are sturgeon and other fish, landlocked salmon that adapted from salt water to fresh water as that lake was cut off from the ocean. As it was, you know, I mean, not in very recent history. You see that whole area of uh, southern Quebec when you cross in from Vermont, across the border, it's all flat farmland. That all yep. used to be ocean floor. So that's why yeah. it's such fer fertile ground. That's why they grow a lot of stuff in that part of Quebec. Yeah, um, and, and yeah. when you get to Vermont, that's when the mountains start. And Lake Champlain is nestled between the Green Mountains and the Adirondacks of upstate New York, so it's that kind of that valley, and it goes down. And um, yeah, there's there's something going on there. I don't know what it is, and I mean, we've done multiple kind of expeditions there. I've obviously did my series there, but uh, the years after, I had a brother who's going to school up there in Vermont, so I was 
constantly visiting the lake whenever I'd go up there and visit him. He was very close to the lake. So it was yeah. really nice for me, you know, nice. it was an excuse to go visit my brother, but also go and do some, uh, you know, searching around, poking around the lake. And I got to know the lake very well in all these different areas, but it's just, you're like a little ant. You can't, there's just such a wide area. You can't really cover it all. I mean, and, and we did a series called chasing legends with some other, uh, people like Nash Hoover. And that's yeah. actually where I, where I started working with Eli Watson. We did a champ episode and I, I had come in contact with a, a longtime scuba diver on the lake who found um, Gary Lefebvre, who actually found a ship wheel of a ship that had been lost for like 200 years. Oh, man. <laughs> the week we were interviewing him. So he's like, oh, I just got off the phone with the BBC and, um, and he, he was taking us out on the lake and using an ROV unit in the water to kind of survey for fish. And he described having, you know, he'd been diving pretty much his whole life on the lake and never had anything strange happen until summer of 2020 yeah saw what he saw like the, the what he describes almost the back of a car just floating in the water in <laughs> one of the deepest sections of the lake thinking it was an overturned tree slows down you know not to hit this thing and it, it moves and just sinks and goes away and he he said it was basically he described it as the back of a giant turtle in the water wild um, <laughs> and so we got to go out on the boat and you know we, we've done multiple trips like that and I just haven't been as active in the champ champ topic. I mean, I was there last summer um, with my buddy Carrick St. Laurent. We, and we camped in the Green Mountains and had potential Bigfoot activity happen, which was crazy. Yeah. On our way to Champ Day, which was this kind of festival <laughs> going on in um, in Port Henry, New York. Right. So, yeah, so that, yeah. You know, so it's kind of funny. You go looking for one thing and something else happens. But um, yeah, so the champ topic is really fascinating. I, I've... Um, you know, I've looked into it quite a bit in the past and I don't know what it is. I think there are misidentifications, of course, you know, especially with water. There's people see weird things and strange kind of phenomena that may seem like a monster. But there are some sightings that are extremely compelling. And um, I'll just give you an example. One of my favorite ones yeah. was um, a, a gentleman who actually owned a bait and tackle shop in uh, Burlington, um, uh, Vince Dottilio. Dottilio is the last name. I yeah. think the, the the tackle shop is still there. He had never really been interviewed about his sighting, and he, it happened in the late 1950s, where him and a group of other guys, and these guys were all either World War II or Korean War vets. At that time, you know, they you didn't talk about cryptids. There, this there yeah. wasn't a, like an awareness of this stuff. It was very rigid when it came to that stuff. But they were fishing near Juniper Island on the lake, and they saw what they described as this dinosaur head creature coming out of the water. And was kind of feeding on the fish that they were gutting and throwing pieces into the water as they were fishing, you know, cleaning up their fish or whatever. And they kind of made a pact to not tell anyone because everyone was going to think they were totally nuts. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. until the 70s and 80s that they actually came forward with their story when the local news media started covering the champ story, when the Mansi photo kind of phenomena was going on. So that was one of my favorite stories because the guy was just, I mean... Uh, I don't know if he's still alive. I hope he is, but he was, you know, he was an old timer. He was up there in age when I, when we got to interview him in 2017 yeah. and he was, he was quite a, quite a, quite a, you know, credible witness, very, you know, um, well-spoken kind of guy, um, you know, cut from a different cloth, you know, that, that sort of a military vet kind of cloth. So, and again, he came from a time where they didn't really discuss this sort of stuff. So, you know, why they made this, if they made this story up, I don't, I don't understand why they would. Right. They saw yeah. something, they saw something and they were all fishing on the lake all the time. You know, you think they would be familiar with the other fish in the lake that they, how would you mistake something for a dinosaur like head sticking out of the water? And he literally described it as looking like this Yeah. You know, with, with his hand showing it and that's in the documentary. So that was, that's one of my favorite ones. There are, there are a number of other ones as well. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so we, we got to talk to quite a few folks. And, you know, there were some folks we talked to, too, that, you know, their sightings uh, were not, you know, they thought it was champ, but then it turned out to be something else. I mean, there was a guy I talked to who thought he was seeing champ creature and it turned out to be a muskrat oh, swimming, weird. <laughs> swimming in the water. And it, it just the lighting and it was too dark for him to really see. So, yeah, yeah, that does happen. But, uh, you know, when you get guys like the, the Tilio and others that have a clear daytime look at something, I mean, it's just it it kind of it intrigues you and the history of the sightings going back to when PT Barnum offered a bounty for champ in the 1870s. That's right. There was that this yeah. <laughs> whole craze of, of monster hunters going on the lake, trying to kill this thing, the serpent yeah. scare in the 1800s, late 1800s in Whitehall, New York, which now of course is known for Bigfoot. 
which is kind of funny. It was, it was first, it was sort of a champ, um, you know, kind of a place where the, there's sightings of this Lake Champlain sea serpent, as they called it back then. Right. And, and now yeah. it's known for Bigfoot. Now Champ ho- or now Whitehall hosts the the Bigfoot Festival, what the you know the Whitehall Bigfoot Festival and all this stuff. And there's <laughs> yeah. there's a long history in that sighting. And you've got people like Paul Bartholomew that have looked into both the Champ phenomena and the big Bigfoot stuff going all in the same area. And either side of Lake Champlain, you have these mountains, the Green Mountains and the Adirondacks, as I mentioned, the long history of Bigfoot sightings too, because they're just great habitat for all sorts of creatures so yeah it kind of ma- it kind of makes sense so it's kind of this cool place where cryptids meet almost yeah no for sure there's there's a lot of uh i feel like in the world of cryptozoology like it's all it's a it's a lot of like west coast midwest southern stuff in new england it seems like it it's kind of like uh the the unsung hero the overlooked uh <laughs> area which, in the, yeah in the which is 48 so, so which i don't get because we have such an abundance of them here i mean the dover demon obviously is one of the biggest kind of stories out there even though it was just seen a few times so many right. years ago yeah yeah the bridgewater triangle puck wudgies i mean these sorts of things have become not only in cryptozoology but you know, Lauren Coleman, one of the most notable cryptozoologists, coined both the Dover Demon and the Bridgewater Triangle. That's and then right. sto- yeah. the stuff like Puckwudgies and the Bridgewater Triangle is known far and wide in the paranormal, you know, more ghost people, UFO people are into that and cryptids. You've got Champ, of course. Yeah, there's, uh, so there's Benning- Bennington Triangle in, in the Southwestern Yeah, Bennington Vermont. Triangle. <laughs> there's an Ossipi Triangle in New Hampshire. I've taken some interesting kind of reports and things out of there. And oh, I mean, yeah. I've got I've got a sticker that of course, I don't have one on hand here, but um, it's a sticker that that I got made called New England Cryptids, and it's got Champ. I think I've, I may have sent it to you. I, I think you did. <laughs> it's probably Champ, in my Bigfoot drawer. Bigfoot and Dover Demon, and it's on <laughs> yeah. a triangle, so it's kind of Bridgewater Triangle because, you know, New England gets, uh, you know, people overlook it again. But I think there's a lot, there's a long history of Sasquatch stuff here, too. You've got older stories like, you know, the Winstead Wild Man in, in Connecticut, the Durham Gorilla in Maine, the Wood Devils of New Hampshire. That's... You've done a shirt, which is still one of my favorite shirts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Love that design for as sure. a New Hampshire guy. Obviously, I represent that. And there's just a long history <laughs> Thanks, here. Man. People yeah. think that, it, that that you know it's kind of unusual, but you look at states like Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire today. Maine and, and New Hampshire are the two most forested states in the United States by percentage of forest. I mean, northern yeah. Maine. Northern Maine is crazy. It's it all is, trees. <laughs> there's more moose than people in, in Northern Maine. You know, yeah. it's got the most amount of moose anywhere in the U.S. outside of Alaska. So you just have a, a huge. So that's kind of a, actually a metric I use a lot of times for looking at potential Sasquatch habitat or an area that might be viable. You know, maybe we should focus on if an environment can support a moose, which is the largest land animal in North America, essentially. Uh, polar bears are, are up there, but moose, I think, still come out right. over especially in Alaska, they come out over the polar bears in size. But if an area can support a large animal like a moose, which can be up to 1,200 pounds, I mean, there's a good chance that if it's it's a healthy enough environment that it supports pretty much everything under uh, under moose size. So that may be something like a Sasquatch might be able to utilize those same areas. So oftentimes we run into that. We've run into that in obviously uh, in here in New Hampshire and Maine and even Colorado and the Rocky Mountains, parts of uh, Washington, and then, of course, Alaska. But uh, elk, elk are a good metric too, usually. Uh, and then black yeah. bear. Black bear, of course, um, probably have the most sort of parallel areas that they might go into that might work for something like a Sasquatch. And it's not definitive. It's just a sort of a theory. It's a metric. It's just you have to understand a, an environment and kind of biology a little bit to, to you know, kind of look at some of these topics or, or, you know, kind of be able to take maybe an educated guess about, hey, maybe this is an area we can look at if it supports this amount of wildlife or these large species, maybe it could support something else. That's just sort of, you know, you, that way you're not taking as much of a stab in the dark when it comes right. to, the, yeah. to the big foot topic. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've also done some uh, investigating into uh, dogman type creatures like the Rougarou, right? Um, didn't you little work bit. on a little bit of that? Yeah. The last episode that I did um, for my show um, was on the Palmyra wolf pack. Okay. Uh, are yep, you familiar yep. with that story? I have heard of it. Yeah. I know. Um, I know that was that the one in um, Vermont or well, it, the it was one in Ohio in Maine, actually. Oh, Palmyra, in Maine. Oh, Maine. Okay. Palmyra, Maine. This family got like totally accosted by this like group of 
humanoid dog creatures at their farm. And it was a really <laughs> uh, quite an intense story. But I mean, you right. look up, you look on the map, it's between um, I think it's between Bangor and Augusta. So it's like oh, okay. central Maine. Pretty, and, pretty wooded. There. There's still some pretty wooded areas. up. Yeah. There. And it's and not a populated a, parts of Maine. Yeah. And it's it's a, you know, a hop, skip and a jump from like the the no man's land of like northern Maine where there's nothing but moose and trees. <laughs> right, right. So it's kind of funny, you know, it's like, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff in in New England. Uh so yeah. definitely don't discount it if uh anyone out there listening is uh <laughs> looking into cryptid stories and all that. So it's yeah. a, a wealth of uh sightings and knowledge for sure. Spectral moose, there's another one. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when to, when to go, I know a lot of people don't really consider that a cryptid and I don't either, but Yeah. Wendigo is 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 an interesting story and that's kind of present throughout the Algonquin tribes and you know the Abenaki which are a big one in the parts of Vermont New Hampshire and Maine they were obviously Algonquin in origins and right you know, yeah but they, they, they are, had that story too <laughs> yeah and they also had the the legend of a uh, a sea serpent type creature in the lake uh, they did Champlain as well so yeah stories, yeah, which, stories of champ go back millennia oh, yeah <laughs> yeah I mean and, and not only not only them but uh, the Iroquois uh, right which were on the other side, which were on the New York side. And the Iroquois and the Abenaki did not like each other. The Iroquois were actually quite aggressive towards them, and they used to go to war and, you know, and enslave each other and whatever. And the Iroquois were more of an organized tribe as a, compared to the Abenaki, which yeah. were a little bit more loosely. I mean, there's different bands, and you know, I've been told that directly by folks that I know that are kind of involved in those communities. But uh, they 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 both had stories of a strange creature in Lake Champlain, a serpent that they would, you know, kind of pay tribute to if they were – crossing into the lake or crossing the wider sections or using it for fishing, um, you know, pita skog. And I think, uh, I forget the other term, but it's kind of great horned serpent. Yeah. They both had different stories about it. And there's some possible petroglyph type, um, you know, artwork in either Northern Vermont or Southern Quebec, not far from the lake that were discovered by a uh, French Canadian archaeologist, I believe up on a rock somewhere up there where they have this sort of strange serpent like yeah. illustration. I mean, yeah, is it possibly champ? <laughs> Yeah, it's an interesting yeah. story. I've never seen the actual petroglyph. And is it, you know, champ for sure? Maybe. I mean, there are snake stories, of course. Snakes were around in that area. So maybe that's what they're describing. But, they're, you know, it's sort of an interesting kind of right. connection to make. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so I wanted to circle back to uh, Bluff Creek. Um, how is it being out there in like the spot where the Patterson Gimlin film was created and you also got to like interview Bobo, uh, yeah. James Fay. So, <laughs> uh, how was that like whole experience? Yeah. I mean, that was awesome. That whole trip was, was super cool. We basically went from Los Angeles to Portland, Oregon and everything in between on a two week Bigfoot binge or, uh, <laughs> you know, the other, the, the road to financial ruin, I think, as Eli <laughs> was calling it, is like a, just a crazy, a lot of stuff went on, you know, just r long trips like that. And we met up with Tate Hieronymus, of course, and we got to hang out with Bobo. We actually interviewed Cliff Berrickman, too, on that trip up at his museum in Oregon. Right. But yeah. so the first part of the trip, we were in Bluff Creek. And then we went up from there to the Mount Hood area in, or in you know, Oregon and near Portland and kind of split it up that way. But uh, Bobo is cool. I mean, an awesome guy. I had actually met him before um, at the Ohio Bigfoot Fest, and we had filmed some stuff for Momo the Missouri Monster. Nice. Um, that uh, STM did back in, I want to say, 2019. So I actually got to drive all the way from the place where uh, Ohio Bigfoot Fest or conference was going on to uh, where we were filming in Ohio and got to just, you know, hang out with Bobo and Cliff, which was pretty hilarious. Because they're they're funny they're funny guys you know yeah people see what they are on TV and you know they they've got a great podcast and they talk they're they're very frank about a lot of the stuff you know that goes on with TV you know because they they legit do Bigfoot stuff all the time they're just funny to hang out with great <laughs> great great guys you know and yeah, they kind of yeah. both have their own rhythm so it's cool hanging out with them but we got to go to Bluff Creek and that trip was was super cool um, essentially the weird stuff started going on as soon as we got into that area i mean we met up with bobo actually in willow creek the town that is not really the closest to bluff creek but it's the closest non you know small village that's kind of there it's it's just a small town still like two two plus hours from the actual film site area at bluff creek 
all okay. driving you to drive that far in. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> we, we went, we met up with Bobo at uh, in Willow Creek and went to a property where they were hearing possible sounds and things going on and kind of poked around. And then we started up for into the mountains and, you know, you start seeing as the hills roll in how remote this area is. And it's one of the, you know, really great wildernesses in, in that part of the world in, in, that, in that kind of California area. Cause you're, you've got the Redwood coast and that's, that's in further. And that yeah. was some of the, some of the last areas that were logged actually even had roads punched through them in the 1950s in the lower 48. I mean, there weren't many areas that hadn't been at least some amount of human activity going in. This area was completely, it was virgin timber. Essentially yeah. they had depleted the Redwoods, which was a, a really a shame, but uh, because there's so few of them left nowadays, but yeah. they depleted the Redwoods and they moved to the interior for the huge Douglas fir trees that were out in the Bluff Creek area. And that's when of course the term Bigfoot came about in the late fifties with the tracks found with the logging crew and having the stuff thrown. And we got to go to the location where those original tracks were found nice. and had some really weird stuff happen as that was going on, as we're being told about this place. And yeah, we spent, we spent like five, five days. I think we spent six days, five nights out at Bluff Creek. First few days we were alone and then we started going in there and, you know, we had just this mysterious rock slide that happened. That was in our, our video. We, we heard some interesting sounds um, we got to talk to a lot of the guys, the Bluff Creek project and other big footers that go out annually to uh, Bluff Creek and, you know, the weird stuff they've had happen. And yeah. even just, even just this summer, our, our buddies, Tate and Ron and Jonathan Easley, they were out there and they found some interesting possible hair out there and heard sounds. So, cool. so Bluff Creek all in all, I mean, it was just incredible going to the actual Patterson Gimmel film site. This is sort of funny. was not really scary. Uh, <laughs> You have to hike in. So we had been staying in this place called Laos Camp, which was a logging camp that was set up and where Tom Slick had sent his expedition to look for to, for Bigfoot in the late 50s, you know, after those tracks yeah, were found. Yeah, right. Very historic Laos Camp. Bobo and Cliff basically used to live down there at one point almost. <laughs> um, there, there's a long history of weird stuff going on. Bobo had a sighting right in Laos Camp. Uh, Daniel Perez used to camp out there for months at a time you know, trying to document Bigfoot stuff. There's been other, other sightings in and around Laos camp with long history of weird stuff. That was creepy staying at Laos camp because you're essentially in this bowl and on either side you have Bluff Creek and Notice Creek and where they meet. So you hear the water moving all the time. So you cannot, you cannot hear anything while you're in camp because you hear that brook babbling. It sounds like people talking. So it's very freaky. You kind of hear this and kind of get this paranoid feeling and there's these big hills right above you. So you're sort of trapped in that area. Whereas when we went, when we went down to the Patterson Gimlin film site, we hiked down just for one night and slept literally where Patty walked from that yeah. footage. <laughs> Not, the, the spook factor was gone. There was me okay. five of us down there and, and Ron's dog bandit. And um, even though the Bluff Creek project, they have game cameras all over that place. They've got mountain lions, dozens of bear, all kinds of animals walking basically right where we were camping we were not really creeped out. We didn't have anything weird happen that night. It was at Laos camp and Laird Meadow where we had weird stuff happen at Laos huh. camp. I recorded this whoop that was very unusual. And, you know, I cannot say it's Sasquatch, but it was very strange. And I've had people analyze it, the audio, and they said the Hertz level was kind of interesting. It was, it was pretty, pretty um, low, which usually, you know, it's on the human or lower side, nobody in camp did this sort of whoop. And I was the only one that heard it because I was right at the edge of camp and everyone else was talking at the fire or, you know, uh, doing something and being loud humans as often is the case. And <laughs> that sound is in the video. And, and my buddy Jonathan's recorded a weird scream from Laos camp a few years ago. And Laos camp seems to be a place where you know, not a lot of people go out in that area, but when they do stay in there, they typically camp at Laos camp. So, and if you're in one of the hills above, you can watch and spy on people and look down and, there is a history of that happening at last yeah. people, people swimming in notice Creek and seeing a Sasquatch up on the hill above them or like Bobo where it kind of came out of the tree line and right. went up the hill. And so it kind of made sense that that was a place where, you know, maybe there's, there's only a, really a few months in the summertime where people are out there and yeah. not very often. It's still to this day, extremely remote getting out there. Yeah. Um, so that whole bluff Creek trip was absolutely amazing. And I, I really want to get back out there someday because you just, you feel that tangible kind of end of the world feeling out there. Hmm. I mean, you could drive off the side of a, of a cliff there and I mean, you're toast. You're, no you're not getting out you. of it. Yeah. Exactly. It's, <laughs> it's scary. It is, it is a scary place in some aspects, but 
so incredibly beautiful. Um, the beautiful crystal blue water in the yeah. creek, Bluff Creek and Notice Creek, and just the the camaraderie and the good times out there and the star view at night. I mean, it's you could see why you know something could still possibly be out there. There's just nothing out there really at all. Yeah, that's wild. Um, and you mentioned um Jonathan Easley, uh, from Western Bigfoot um exploration. He he play uh you played the clip of that sound that he recorded yeah. in the documentary. And it reminded me so much of like the Sierra sounds. Like <laughs> it was it was yeah, pretty that, haunting. Like people how have said that they were. to him before. Yeah. yeah. And it's it was a really weird one because I guess he didn't notice that sound until after he got back home and was just it was a bad take. He was like, oh, I'm gonna throw this clip away. And then he's like, what is this sound? And he's asking everyone at camp, you know, what did anyone do a weird scream? But they're all with an earshot. And it was just like a rah, rah, super weird noise. I mean, why somebody at camp and there was yeah. like four of them there would be doing that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, especially when he's like doing take after take, like trying yeah, to get his lines just, right. <laughs> exactly. He's just trying yeah. to, he's trying to dictate, a, you know, just the, the narration of what, what, you know, Hey, we're leaving camp. That was it. It wasn't like a special moment or anything just happened to catch it. And that's exactly what happened with that whoop that I got was um, kind of pr- uh, leading up to that incident was we were being shown the original area outside of Laos camp where those Bigfoot tracks were found in 19 in the 1950s that yeah. gave way to the term Bigfoot. And our buddy Ron Reed's dog just started acting really weird. It was it was just getting dark, and there was a big group of us there. We were being led by some of the Bluff Creek Project guys, and bandits started acting strange. And this dog has hiked the entire Appalachian Trail, has backpacked with Ron, total hardcore adventure dog, probably hiked more than most humans. So it's been around bears and other creatures before, and it started and bandits started acting weird. Duck, it kept ducking into the bushes. Some of the guys towards the back of the group said they were hearing like movement and knocks in the woods and bandit was the tail complete his tail was between his legs i mean i've never seen a dog that defeated looking and we actually had to uh, leash him because we had to take a belt jonathan's belt and make a leash and ron never has to leash this dog he's usually so (laughs) well behaved and we had to take him back to camp so i was just checking on him after that that's when i have and i happen to be filming and i hear this strange whoop and i said oh was that ken thought it was Ken Gearhart because yeah. there was Ken was in camp and there was a bunch of people and sometimes guys will do whoops. And if you've seen the movie Willow Creek, um, actually a lot of those scenes were filmed right there in Laos camp. Oh, wow. The, the, the Bobcat <laughs> Goldwaith movie. Yeah. And yeah. some of the guys like Rowdy Kelly and Robert Leiterman, uh, I believe both of them were involved with the Willow Creek movie. And they, they were like the Bigfoots that you hear in the background when they're in the tent. Okay. <laughs> um, they were making those noises. So sometimes they'll do that when we're all together in the group setting and you know that's what i just assumed it was i assumed it was one of them and upon checking with everybody and then afterwards when we got back still checking with people was it your dog was it anybody nobody could confirm that it was them and just the sound signature it had in a spectrogram analysis was very unusual so i put it in that interesting pile and you know what was it a bigfoot i don't know possibly but the, the other circumstances around that incident with bandit acting the weirdest he's ever acted, even according to Ron, was very strange. And, um, you know, that wasn't the, the end of the weirdness there at Laos camp. But it was we just had a lot of these weird things that happened that uh, couldn't really explain. I mean, another one real quick I'll tell you, sure. tell you about is and what didn't make it in the film because, you know, we just didn't really know how to tell the story of this. But um, Eli had had a dream. Actually, one of the nights we were camping before the rest of the crew showed up, all these Bluff Creek Project guys, they have an annual camping trip out there every year, essentially. Yeah. It was just Tate, myself and Eli for the first two or three nights. And I'm just sleeping in a tent with Eli, you know, whatever. Three in the morning, I don't know, two, three in the morning, he just starts freaking out. And I thought he was having either a heart attack or a seizure or something. I mean, he's screaming, Yikes. top of his leg, <laughs> thrashing. And I'm like, do I grab a knife? Like, what do I do? Is there yeah. something attacking us? Because, you know, in that sense of sleep, you're 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 deep asleep and you get violently woken up. You're, you're, you're kind of in shock. Yeah. Uh, ne- you know, next, whatever, we both fell asleep. Next morning we talked to him. He says, oh, I got attacked by a coyote in my sleep. And I was fighting it. I was sleeping at the edge of the river and, you know, it bit my arm and I was, I was wrestling with it and I was sleeping my sleeping bag out in the open next to the river and that's when it attacked me. Oh, and geez. we were like, oh, okay. It was kind of became a funny story, right? Yeah. Like, oh, haha. And then we're telling Jamie Wayne of the Bigfoot uh, or the Bluff Creek Project about this dream. 
and you know we're like oh we got to hear Eli's funny story and he didn't respond in like a funny way he was like oh that's really interesting you say that he said this this camp this area used to be Yurok tribal hunting grounds and in Yurok folklore they say that if you you know are see a coyote or if you're attacked by one it means you're not welcome here interesting Um, so and he was a guy and you know he wasn't from that background but he had actually lived in the area and spent I, i think he took some classes at their on their reservation there in um, Northern California and kind of was familiar with the folklore and was, and was told that story specifically because they knew he was kind of into the Bigfoot stuff. He told us that and Eli and I kind of looked at each other like, that's freaky. Good yeah. thing it was our one of our last nights out there <laughs> because it's just one of those things that you hear that it's either a really crazy coincidence or I mean, something going on. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to, how to explain that. How, can you really explain that? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, I don't uh, know, but it was, it just <laughs> lined up so perfectly that it was just like, wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, very strange, <laughs> strange yep, and interesting. So. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for sharing that, man. <laughs> yeah. It, that was, a, and it was just, I wish we had had the audio. I thought, cause we had been recording audio all those nights out there at last camp, but I had to put the audio far out of camp so I didn't get the constant river sounds. So I was hoping, oh, maybe I'll get Eli screaming on the audio recorder oh, so we can put that in the episode. <laughs> yeah. But it was too far away that we didn't catch him screaming because it was it was like, I'm telling you, I, I woke up and thought he was having a heart attack or a seizure. That was, yeah. that was my first reaction. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Scary stuff, man. Um, well, so beyond... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, beyond the trail, beyond beyond like cryptid stuff, you've done a little bit of work on the uh, on the trail of UFO uh, UFOs a little bit. Can you talk about that for a minute? Just switching gears from yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <Bigfoot. laughs> no, for sure. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I've always been more into the cryptid topic uh, or topics, I should say. All the different, you know, mountain lions, uh, mystery big cats is another big one I'm interested in. Um, obviously, Bigfoot is just the cool thing about Bigfoot is you you go there's so many places you can go, right? There's stories, whether it's Skunk Ape or Alaska or a- anywhere. I mean, yeah. North America, essentially, there's a lot of those stories. Whereas something like Lake Champlain, it's confined to a particular geographic area. You don't have, ev- not every lake has a champ in it, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> so, but the UFO topic is another one of those ones where it's kind of all over the place. And the craziest thing I've ever personally witnessed has been what I can only describe as a UFO in in central Pennsylvania, um, and I, I say by definition of the word unidentified flying object, I don't know what it was. Um, I, we filmed it. I was out there on a trip with some, some colleagues of mine that are more into the UFO and ghost topics. We were kind of doing this Pennsylvania triangle case we were looking at. This was in 2018, 2019, I want to say. Okay. Um, and, uh, we were out there and, and, you know, there's a lot of Bigfoot stories in the area. That's primarily what I was interested in. I'm like, oh, I don't really care about <laughs> the UFO and all that other stuff. Yeah. And I, we saw this object in the sky that essentially was like this, it was like a illuminated cloud that was just meandering through the sky that had small bright lights that flew out of it and flew back into it. And, um, huh. when our, and one of our guys, Paul Eno, who of, of, um, you know, behind the paranormal show, he's, he's literally one of the oldest, well, long, longest researching paranormal researchers out there. This guy got his start under Ed and Lorraine Warren in like the 60s. He's been doing Bigfoot and UFOs and aliens, all this stuff, ghosts, especially long yeah. time. And he actually managed to film this thing on a night vision unit. And in the video, we have it. It's on my website. Um, and we've had we've had some shows about it, too, You know, where we've shown the, the, the footage. And you can see this object, two objects, a smaller one and a larger one, just parallel flying the whole time in the clip and then they become one towards the end really strange so i had seen that and you know seth at the time was working on on the trail ufos with shannon legro and you know he kind of knew ufos weren't really my thing but he said hey you guys had that weird experience i mean would you want to talk about it i was like yeah sure and we got to talking about actually doing a whole new hampshire uh, kind of beyond the, uh, or not beyond the trail. I'm always, there's so many, so many <laughs> yeah. of the titles <laughs> on the trail UFOs, because obviously, you know, New Hampshire is pretty famous in the UFO world. You've got the, you know, Betty and Barney Hill abduction case. That's a big one. The Exeter UFO. Yes. Incident. Yes. You know, and the white mountains are my stomping grounds. I've hiked all the, the peaks above 48, 4,000 footers up that are up in New Hampshire and a lot of great squatchy and, you know, Bigfoot kind of terrain up there and wood devil stories. But I'm never really crazy about the UFO stuff, but uh, they came up here and we shot in Exeter, actually, with the famous Exeter incident, talked to some folks involved with that and then went up to the White Mountains and 
Um, and then, and Seth interviewed me about my UFO experience. And then turns out another Fordian researcher, Sean Forker from Pennsylvania had actually investigated the same property about a decade prior. And he had had strange activity happen at that same property where there was, I mean, there was like Bigfoot reports. There was UFOs, unmarked black helicopters flying in the sky, a whole kind of smorgasbord of weirdness. And so it was kind of cool, but yeah, so that was, um, you know, that was uh, late 2019 that we did on the trail UFOs. And, and um, that was kind of interesting. That was the first iteration. And obviously they've done since then, they've done a few other ones as well. And um, I haven't been as involved in those as I have in the, like the on the trail of Bigfoot films and obviously what we do, but um, it's an interesting topic. I think there's a lot to it. And I think you see how mainstream it's gotten the UFO subject. I mean, with all the talk of government disclosure and, storm area 51 i mean let's not forget that like it, it really yeah. broke through the rubicon you know and, and it's in that sort of modern or it's in the in kind of it's in the culture so bigfoot i think is yet to get there it's getting pretty popular i mean will we see ufo or bigfoot disclosure movement in the future with the government possibly i mean if <laughs> the ufo topic whatever's unfolding with that i mean i know there's a lot of strong opinions on that and i'm i kind of view it from the sidelines because i'm not i don't really have a dog in the fight Mm-hmm. Um, so to speak, because I'm just not as interested in that topic. Uh, what I saw was very unusual. I don't know how to describe it. Was it aliens? I don't know. Was it secret government technology? Possibly. It was a UFO. That's all I can say. But the weirdest thing, hands <laughs> down, that I've ever seen out out during any of these kind of investigations, that was it was that incident. So, and there were other things that accompanied that. But then we talked to the locals about it, and they were kind of like, "Oh yeah, that sort of stuff happens a lot around here." They're like almost unfazed by it. And we were, you know, we're all freaking out. Some of these guys have been looking into big, uh, UFOs for like 30 years. And they were like, oh, this was the most amazing thing I'd seen. And the locals were kind of <laughs> like, oh, you know, we see that sort of stuff a lot. I'm like, really? You got- yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's funny. Just, they're used to the the, the stra- high strangeness, I guess. I don't know. It's funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, I won't do any. Have you seen the, the, the movie Nope? Uh, Jordan Peele's new movie? I ha- no, I haven't. No, I okay. haven't been to the- I- I, embarrassingly, I haven't seen a movie in a theater, I think, since the last Jurassic World. Oh, man. The last one. That, that was a couple months ago. Well, I, mean, <laughs> I think it was like May or something. I don't know. Yeah. So my fiance and I went to to uh, go see it like the other week. Um, and uh, I won't give away any spoilers since I'm sure you haven't seen it, obviously. But your, des- your description of um, like the cloud was uh made me think of that movie for sure huh. yeah i guess i'll have to check it out and and uh and and see because yeah, it was just such a weird thing because it was a it was a, st- a starry night there weren't any clouds so i i was like what is this cloud doing there it was like a hazy cloud with a with a light inside of it just slow motion meandering like a leaf like up in this yes. motion and then just these other objects shooting out of it and we didn't capture that part but in the video you can see this, these two objects going parallel. I mean, I don't know any any aviation things that have a, a kind of a, a a weird blobby mass that has a little dot that just flies parallel, detached from it. I don't. I, I really. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what to make of it. No. But no explanation. It was, it was pretty wild. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, it was some kind of smoke screen or <laughs> cloaking technology. Is the, yeah. Is, is it secret technology? They're just having fun seeing what people's reactions are to it. I mean, yeah. Who knows? Uh, we tried to find out if there's anyone else who saw it that night, but um, we weren't able to to get any leads because we had had a town hall meeting there in town two days after that happened, and then the night after that, we had this weird audio experience too, and. It was just, it was, it was a strange, strange time. And that kind of opened my eyes a little more to the high strangeness elements because I was primarily into the Bigfoot stuff then. I was kind of like rolling my eyes when people were mentioning seeing shadow people and other weird things and unmarked black helicopters. I was like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, but that, that sort of changed my view a little bit. And you're not, not like I'm saying it's, it's all legit, but it kind of made me think, okay, yeah, maybe there are other weird something. things going on. Yeah, yeah. There's other weird things that happen for sure. So, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> um you mentioned uh there's some wood devil stories that you know about could you talk about those for a second like up in uh yeah, coas county i'd love to hear some of that yeah i love coas county that's a uh, you know great place so remote up there a lot of great camping spots and just spots to explore tons of moose too i've had a lot of moose encounters up there um, but the wood devil stories of something that's always interested me and I, I remember hearing reading about them way back even bigfootencounters.com bobby short used to run and 
um, other people, you know, like the, the really early days of the internet, they used to talk about that sort of stuff. And when I was younger, I'd read about it and wood devils. And I, I could never figure out if it was sort of when, when that term originated and, uh, whether it was an internet thing or pre-internet. But since then, I've been told quite a few stories and I've gathered about 50 plus sightings from New Hampshire uh, oh, when it wow. comes to big, to Bigfoot. Yeah. I've, I've done a lot of done about six or seven library talks in all across different parts of New Hampshire about the Granite State Bigfoot. And I talk about some of the stuff because I did a documentary in 2016 about a researcher up in the White Mountains hmm. of Abenaki origin who looks into called Shy Man of the White Mountains. That's the sort of the documentary name. It was on, it was on my Sasquatch out of the Shadows YouTube channel. And um, I spent a lot of time going up to the Berlin area. Hmm. and hearing the wood devil stories and having some kind of interesting activity up there. I mean, I was going up there almost every weekend uh, back in 2015, 2016 time. Um, beautiful, beautiful areas. I mean, right outside of Berlin, outside of town, you just got these mountains, um, extreme wilderness, just right on the edges of town. You know, these people live with moose and bear and all this sort of stuff. And there's a lot of wood devil stories up in that area. Hunters seeing, you know, something they de they described as a Sasquatch, but eating fermented apples and almost stumbling and being drunk. <laughs> Interesting. To the point where we actually disturbed <laughs> the hunters. They they were so disturbed. One of the hunters didn't want to ever go back to that spot. Um, but, yeah. uh, you know, so I've heard a lot of these stories over the years. Um, you know, more some are more just traditional kind of Bigfoot sightings. The Wood Devil seemed to be, in my opinion, just a, 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 a pre-Bigfoot name that was given to Bigfoot. You know, what they're describing essentially is a tall, hairy lanky kind of man-like creature that lets out screams at night that could, you could almost walk into one before seeing it and they would yeah. hide behind the they would hide in between the trees right and that what does that sound like you know in a modern contract context because there is a lot of stories that people attribute to being bigfoot you know if they're like local other monsters or something that maybe they're not maybe they are but this one like i think a majority of these hairy hominid stories that you hear that are don't have the Bigfoot name. It's a pre Bigfoot story. I, I, you know, it's usually they're describing that in just their local kind of terms. So the wood devils, I mean, one of the, one of the most interesting ones I've gotten, and I'm still trying to track down the lead for this. And it's probably one of the biggest regrets I've made actually in this, in this topic was I did a library talk in Dover, New Hampshire in early 2020. And one of my favorite parts about these talks is afterwards, people come up and tell you their stories. Yeah. Oftentimes, I'll at least get two or three encounters, a, a library session of people sharing a, their story or one that they know of. And this woman told me this in, a story about it was either her father or grandfather or uncle, excuse me, who was a, actually a prison camp guard at a place in, called Stark, New Hampshire. There was a prisoner of war camp during the Second World War up there where they had German POWs. Oh, wow. And dark to this day. I mean, it's the middle of Coas County. There's nothing out there. It's super remote. So, you know, her uncle or, or father was out there as one of these camp guards and described, you know, the Germans were put on, on logging duty. So they were hmm. cutting trees. I mean, that's that whole area. There's a lot of logging because there's just nothing but trees practically. Yeah. Um, you know, Berlin's called the city that trees built just because all the paper mills and all that stuff they had out there. But the, the, the woman said that the Germans were put on um, logging duty and that they apparently at one point were complaining about not wanting to go in the woods because they saw gorillas in the woods. No way. <laughs> which is, yeah, you know, what what these guys that, you know, they're obviously prisoners of war being brought over to the United States. They had no connection to Kalas County or any of the stories. And they kind of described it as being gorilla-like. And, and my biggest regret, as I mentioned, was, you know, in the, in the fog of the moment, you're at an event, there's a lot of people that want to talk to you and, I gave her my card and I said, can you please contact me? That was a huge, huge rookie mistake. Mm. <laughs> Always take their information down so you can hound them about, you know, right. details. So I didn't do that and I regret uh. it because she didn't contact me. And I've been trying to find out for years this story. And recently, actually, uh, like a few weeks ago on uh, on YouTube, on um, the first episode of Beyond the Trail, uh, the Granite State Bigfoot case, which is about, a you know, kind of a different Bigfoot case in southern New Hampshire that, you know, I've been kind of... Um, looking into over the past few years, had some encounters. I know some folks, I had a comment on that video from somebody saying, well, something along the lines of, yeah, there was a camp up in Stark and the the prisoners of war up there described seeing, you know, Bigfoot like creatures in the woods. And you know, the locals just called them the wood devils. 
And I was like, I, I tried to reach out to this YouTube comment. You're like, where do you know this from? Yeah. So it's another, it's another person that apparently knows this story. And I, to my knowledge, I'm the only one that's talked about it online. So I'm hoping they didn't just listen to like an older podcast of mine. <laughs> and that, that's where they got that information. Cause then that's circular info. But um, that story is really interesting because again, it involves people that whether or not, if it's real, I mean, I don't know. It's so hard. It's so hard to know because it's you know convoluted in that sense. Um, you know, it's a story that somebody was telling me that they heard from somebody, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to verify details, but it's very intriguing. You know, there's that. And, and I've been told as well about, uh, uh folks, uh, one guy told me that his family had a camp up there in Coas County near Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. And they, um, his grandfather used to warn him about, don't go too far in the woods or the wood devils to get you. Yeah. And this is like in the 1970s. So well before the internet. So that term has clearly been around for a while. And, um, you know, there's just been other Bigfoot stories, you know, more, you know, modern kind of day stuff I've heard. And people usually just call it Bigfoot when they see it up there. But, uh, you know, some people do refer to it as wood devil sort of thing. So they, it's, it's super interesting because some people talk about it and say it's something different than Bigfoot. But the way I've, as I mentioned now, people kind of use those terms almost interchangeably they'll say either Bigfoot because maybe they've seen some of the programs they've seen finding Bigfoot or whatever. Yeah. But they, I mean, if they don't, they might use the wood devil term, but they're kind of describing the same thing. A hairy man, like creature being seen in similar areas. Right. So um, yeah, the wood devils is a personal favorite of mine. I'm hoping to do kind of a, a bigger documentary on that and really kind of try to get more to the uncover the origins of that story and who brought that up and where did that term come from? Oh yeah. That would be amazing. Cause I, I feel like, um, you know, like I've done, you know, a little bit of reading about the wood devils before, but there's not really a lot of, uh, detailed information or lore that's available. And if, you know, you're getting stories from people <laughs> who are, yeah. are in that area and like, yeah, but that's awesome. <laughs> I love and it. And people up there, they don't really, you know, they're not as keen to outsiders, I guess. I mean, they're, you know, obviously tourism, tourism is big in New Hampshire. So people, they love the tourist money, but you know, you're not just going to be able, even if I were just to move up there tomorrow and start talking to all the locals, you know, they're going to give me the stink eye for probably the first few years They're, You know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not one of them. I'm a flatlander that's coming from the Southern part of the state, which is basically Massachusetts. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm not going to be as welcome. At yeah. least that's, that's from what I perceive, but having ends in that community and, you know, knowing like a researcher like Michael Eastman has told me a lot of the stories that people that he grew up with and in that area who had encounters and things that happened and uh, just hearing, like I said, other people that have reached out, we've had YouTube comments. People will say, well, I saw this thing growing up in Milan or this thing in Dummer. And then I'm able to reach out to them and they can kind of give me more details. And that's been really super cool about all these documentaries is just hearing people share their stories from those areas, you know, whether it's Bluff Creek or the Rocky Mountains of Colorado or, or even the swamps of Florida. I mean, we have been to so many locations. We've got like 18 documentaries at this point and almost each of those has been in a different state or different location. So yeah. it, yes, I'm, I'm pretty focused in New Hampshire cause I'm from here and I, I think it's a, it's a hidden gem. This whole area, as we talked about with just the cryptid stuff in general, champ, uh, whether it's, you know, Vermont with champ, uh, other Bigfoot stories in Vermont, Maine, it's just kind of under the radar. It's not really on the Bigfoot, um, you know, kind of but better known spots for the topic. And I, I think there's a lot of really interesting stories here. So yeah. I do try to focus on the New Hampshire whenever I can, but obviously we're so wide spread with this topic <laughs> that, you know, a place like Alaska, other places as well, we try to try to get those too, because I, you know, there's so many great places and just going, being able to go to these beautiful locations is one of the most rewarding things to me and seeing often places that not a lot of people get to see. Uh, it's just been, it's been a complete blessing, honestly. And, we, uh, we have had some crazy adventures along the way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I've got a few more questions here for you and for sure. uh, some, uh, some audience questions as well. Uh, so I think, um, we're at the top of the hour here. Um, here. He, oh, okay. So here, Here's what we're going to do. I'll do one question, then we'll jump into audience questions. <laughs> sure, sure. Sounds good to me. <laughs> um, all right. So are you a proponent of uh, the flesh and blood Sasquatch uh, or do you entertain the idea of uh, these creatures potentially having something more paranormal about them uh, or 
you know, interdimensional. Like we've talked about a little bit of like, you know, Bigfoot and then there's like UFO, some, some right. kind of correlation there. So w- what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's definitely an interesting question. Obviously a lot of one that people oftentimes ask me about, and I do sort of lean more into the flesh and blood camp. Um, and that's simply because of my personal experience and, you know, th- I've never seen a Sasquatch. I, I can't say 100% that they are real. I do strongly believe that they are so, and not, not really believe, um, just because of the things I've, some of the things I've experienced and just the sheer amount of people I've talked to and, uh, and, you know, eyewitness interviews, people that have never been on a show or on a podcast before. I've interviewed plenty of those people that have, you know, they've shared their stories with others in the past, but people who you kind of have to pry that information out of people that they actually would have something to lose, uh, credibility wise, if they were to come out with a story like this, um, you know, in a place like New Hampshire or even elsewhere, where it just seems like, why would they want to be associated with this story? <laughs> and they'll tell you once they're comfortable enough with you. But all those people I've talked to, the majority of sightings, uh, like the vast majority, seem to be this thing is acting in a way that there's no other strain. I mean, strange enough to see a large eight foot tall ape in the woods, right? That's yeah. weird enough that's if you're not that that's if that's not weird enough right that's that's usually what people are describing and there's no other weirdness to it you know there's oh this thing ran across the road or i saw it go up the side of a hill or it walked through the swamp or it, it saw me and it looked at me and it ran away that that kind of thing there aren't any other weird factors to it um, but there are yeah. a minority a mi- minority of people i've spoken to that have described glowing lights or orbs in the woods or other weird things and i don't know how to address that or <laughs> explain it i mean and i'm not gonna the thing is i'm not going to um disregard it either i think there's been researchers in the past and um folks that have sort of if it didn't fit their worldview in terms of what sasquatch is they just omitted those details which i don't think is right at all i think we should you know th- those should be part of the story if that's this person's telling you hey i saw a bigfoot and then i saw a glowing orb uh, that's part of their story who am i to to <laughs> cherry pick the data that, to fit my working theory i mean yeah. that's not that doesn't sit right with me so but again majority reports majority of people i talk to there isn't any other weird circumstances aside from seeing a large man-like creature that you know is supposed to not exist in the woods that, right that wasn't good enough. that's usually so i i typically lean in that direction and some of the things uh you know i think a lot of people don't understand um how much wilderness there still is in north america i mean it's just staggering and there's less people now in some of these more remote areas uh, don't get me wrong. There's people everywhere. People hike and backpack and go into crazy places, but there is still so much space. I mean, let alone places like Canada and Alaska, where majority of like the Canadian population lives within a hundred miles of the U.S. border. Right. I think I think like over fifty percent of it is is that like Toronto area. Yes. Kind of. Yes. Yeah. So it's... the rest of Canada is just <laughs> Alaska too. Is just it's it's really unless you've seen it. I mean, there's places you could die one hundred times over in like one valley in terms of, you know, hazardous places to go where nobody would ever find you in a million years. Yeah. Um, so there's, and, and like I said, the lower 48, there's still some really remote spots I mean, places in Maine and New Hampshire that used to be clear cut are now thick woods that support moose and other huge wildlife. So, you know, could these creatures have also come with a lot of these wildlife that's returned into these areas that are reclaiming their natural habitat. So, yeah, I do lean more in the flesh and blood side. I haven't had anything super weird happen with it. I know a lot of people, you know, get really charged one way or the other. Um, and I just, I, like I said, I don't like to just omit people's details when it comes to what they had happen. You know, if that's part of their story, that's fine. I mean, my personal opinion about what they experienced aside, I mean, I can try to, you know, give my opinion on it, but I'm not, I'm not going to rewrite the data about what they saw. I don't think that sits right with me. So yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> So yeah, and it's it's a you know I think it's a lot of the stuff it requires some nuance and um, it's not a you know, simple yes or no kind of answer. It's there's a little bit to kind of discuss because I think people are very myopic on the topic and they think oh it's one way or the other and maybe there's more than there's multiple things going on. I don't really know. I yeah. mean, there's so little we actually know about this topic. <laughs> you, and, you know, you got to look at every angle. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. and that's I think just the that goes back to what I was saying earlier in the show about really doing your research and just thinking critically and evaluate your sources and you know, realize that people have may have agendas and the certain way they're portraying things and 
you know, are they more on a paranormal aspect? So maybe they're going to hype up some of those details that may be described, or are they like so hardcore flesh and blood that they're going to cut off a person's interview where they talk about orbs or glowing <laughs> things or UFOs, right? Oh, man. It, there's yeah. both of that. Trust me, there, right. I've experienced it personally. There's both of that on both sides. And I think, I don't think either of them are justified in the way they, they do it, you know, in those cases. Oh, man. <laughs> wow. Jeez. Yeah, we won't, we won't be cutting off anything here for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's jump into some uh, audience and um, patron member questions. Um, all right, so uh, Meg from uh, Patreon has two questions. Uh, sure. First is, what area has been your favorite so far in the Beyond the Trail series? And second, uh, what are the most effective and necessary tools to have out in the field. You're a big gear guy too. I was going to, yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was going to ask you it, but then this one came through. So <laughs> uh, those are both difficult questions I will say, but first part is, Oh my gosh, I will preface that it's a cheat with a cheat answer. And then I'll give my real answer. How's that? <laughs> Sounds so good. <laughs> all, all the places we've been to are incredible. I mean, when I just think back on being able to go, I mean, it, the past few years, I've seen more of the United States than I've ever seen in my life. And, you know, whether it's the, the high Uinta mountain range of Utah or the Everglades and being able to walk a couple miles into the swamps in the Everglades, absolutely incredible. I mean, so it's just such a tough one. The Rocky Mountains of Colorado, even parts of Ohio that you just you don't think as, you know, Ohio is being particularly scenic, but actually kind of surprise you. So we've been so fortunate. But I mean, that property in Alaska, I've got to say is probably up there in my top 10 places I've ever been to. And I've traveled a lot of the other parts of the world too. And it's just something else out there. I mean, everywhere you look, it's incredible. You've got humpback whales coming out in the bay in the morning and orcas and sea lions and seals. And then on shore, you've got moose and grizzly bear and black bear and mountain goat and lynx and every other animal you can imagine. And these gigantic snow capped peaks all around you. And then you're in these mossy rainforests. I mean, it's something out of this world. It's, it's not like an experience I could easily describe. So yeah. that that's probably one of my tops. And then, and uh, again, I'm cheating here, but <laughs> I will say the high Uinta mountain range of Utah is incredibly scenic, very beautiful. And then, and then I guess I'd say Bluff Creek. I mean, just, just for that remoteness. So those are some of my favorites. I mean, they're all my favorites, realistically, even West <laughs> Virginia. We were in West Virginia recently, even the Smoky Mountains. I was down there in July and yeah. I didn't like the, hum I didn't like the humidity, but I love <laughs> being in the Smokies. But yeah, so yeah, I'll, I'll stick with the Alaska thing. And then when it comes to gear, um, I know I ramble a lot, so I'll try to keep it more concise. But I think <laughs> in terms of like, cause when we're doing it, we almost have like a three tier approach because a lot of times we're, if we're hiking or backpacking into an area, I need to have the necessary items to keep myself safe and, um, you know, hydrated and fed and sheltered when I'm out in the woods. Like even if I wasn't going big footing and, and filming, I'd need to have that equipment. So we have that, we've got to cover that side, but then we've also got to have the filmmaking side. So we've got all of the other gear that we're bringing and then you have the big footing side. So there's other equipment that, that goes along with that. So I'll give, I'll just give an example from each of those tiers of, of, of essential equipment. Let's say you're trying to do all three, or I'll just give it, I guess, in my example. Um, so on, when it comes to the big footing side, I think, gosh, that's also, that's a tough one actually <laughs> to think of now, because I'm just thinking like all of my gear, but we'll, we'll just go with some simple stuff. My essential gear essentially is I'll go with the Dr. Jeff Meldrum field guide that I have. Um, it's a Bigfoot field guide. It's it's just like a wildlife field guide. You can tuck it right into, I, I usually tuck it into my Peterson wildlife tracking guide. It's, it's laminated. It's got a ruler on it. It's got a lot of descriptions of what bear tracks and other animals look that you might mistake for Sasquatch. Other things, what Sasquatch is typically reported to be like, uh, you know, obviously Dr. Jeff Meldrum compiled that based on lots of different sightings. And there's a lot of good details there. And I think that's just a good item to have let's say you don't have a ruler measuring tape or even a dollar bill. That's another one I stress for people to have out in the woods for comparison's sake. If you don't have a ruler uh, measuring tape, just grab yourself a good old dollar bill, slap it next to your track. And I mean, this is a universal instrument. Essentially, we know how big it is and dimension wise. Don't just put your hand in front of it because people have different, <laughs> different right. size uh, hands. So the, the field guide's a great one to have out that on that big footing side. And when it comes to the filmmaking side, I would say, 
Probably my Sony a7 is my one of my essential pieces of filmmaking gear. That's the camera that we do a lot of interviews on, a lot of B-roll, a lot of slow motion footage when you see us jumping over logs trying to look really cool and cooler than we are. <laughs> That's done in slow motion with the Sony a7. That's nice. a piece of essential gear. And then when it comes to the survival gear, I would say probably... Uh, oh gosh, because there's just so much. I mean, aside from no, needing the essentials for being able to stay alive out there, I'd say probably Sawyer uh, Sawyer Mini Squeeze. So it's a uh, water filter, essentially that you you can put on certain bottles. I mean, Life water bottles happen to work really well. This is something a lot of Appalachian Trail through hikers and other folks do. You just squeeze it under your water bottle, and what it allows you to do is I can take that full big empty Life water bottle, fill it up in a creek or a stream put that, uh, the Sawyer squeeze on there and I can actually drink it straight from there. Cause that filters the water right there. Oh, so nice. you can't, you can only go like three days without water. So all the other equipment aside, I mean, you, you do need a lot of other things, but having a, a way to filter water, you could boil it too. That's obviously a good one too. Mm-hmm. But, um, if you want fresh, cool mountain water, do you want to make sure you're not going to get Giardia or some kind of waterborne parasite? Sawyer squeeze, you know, there's certain bottles that'll fit like life bottles, super, super cheap. And, um, you can get one for like 15, 20 bucks at Walmart, you know, Sawyer squeeze. So that's a really essential piece for keeping yourself alive, especially if you are not packing enough water out there. So there you go. Long answer. I know, <laughs> but from each of the three tiers, uh, cause you know, I, we could talk about gear the rest of the night just cause oh, yeah, totally. I, I've got a lot of other thoughts, you know, personal safety equipment, obviously, whether it's a firearm or bear spray or something like that, but we could, we could, yeah, that's a whole nother discussion, I guess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, dude. Um, thanks for that. Um, uh, my next question I, I've got here is, uh, from Nolan over on my Patreon and he asked, uh, if you could capture definitive proof of any one cryptid on film, which would it be and why? That the real, the always the tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. Is that an option? Right. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> I would say, I would say probably, I mean, it's tough because maybe, maybe I'll go with Sasquatch. I think that's pr- just because I think that's the one that I've been the most invested in. That's the one that we're obviously constantly looking for um, being able to find some evidence that we can not only film one maybe preferably with b- both you know uh, either still photos footage you know high quality 4k camera and some thermal footage so you have not only one type of footage you have two types of footage so that's you know it's uh, because nowadays the thing is you put out a piece of footage or, or a photo everyone's just going to scream fake immediately yep. <laughs> yep. you have to have and, and and what's really important about evidence in general is that we as researchers and folks that are out there in the woods, even just, you know, people just out there in the woods, you have an experience, something happens to you, you kind of get emotionally attached to that piece of evidence. So a lot of times when there's pushback, people get offended and they get upset and like, oh, no, you guys are just haters, that kind of thing. And, yeah. you know, no, people should be skeptical because there are so many boguses out there and fake, worse than fake hoaxes and it just muddies the waters. It's really unfortunate. So video evidence, I think alone will never be enough to prove this, but if we're able to get multiple types of media about a certain event, that'd be great. But even better than that, if let's say we can only film it with one camera, maybe after that event, we're able to document uh, footprints, possibly collect hair samples, get any other kind of secondary evidence that we can then pair with not only our affidavits of our witness i wit you know our 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 actual recollections of witnessing that event with Mm -hmm. the the media the visual and physical evidence i mean you have three different tiers of evidence that make it you know a little bit easier to kind of prove your point but will the video ultimately move the needle any further i don't think so but it would be really cool to get a good thermal or something like that uh, and just, you know, get something on film like that. And we're, we're hoping, I mean, so as I mentioned with the eyewitness encounters, so many of them happen by chance, right? People are hiking a trail and it crosses the path, it crosses the road, whatever. And they're usually never prepared. Most people are not prepared. Almost seems like yeah. these things are just <laughs> messing with people and doing this sort of thing. But if we, you know, we're out there so many times in these areas that have, you maybe have a history of sightings or have had activity. If we just happen to be lucky enough to be at the right place at the right time to be able to document it, I mean that would be awesome. I mean, so many times, even we're out there when stuff happens, we're not ready for it or the audio recorder is dead or the battery's dead or whatever. So but we're hoping that we, we might not uh, be caught with our pants on the ground when uh, 
something like that walks by and we're able to to document it. So that's kind of the the, the thinking behind it, at least. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> All right. A uh, couple more here. Uh, John Trapper from Instagram asks, uh, what brought you into the field of cryptozoology and uh, what inspires you to, you know, do what you do? Yeah, good question. Um, well, uh, directly, I was as a kid, I was on a ski trip with my family in the White Mountains. And I and my dad told me the story of the Yeti. And he gave me this uh, Yeti action figure oh, nice. shadow box, really high quality. It came with like a paper scroll that had the whole story of the Yeti. That's awesome. I'm just always, and, and there's just something about that in the setting with the mountains. It just captivated me. So uh, I started watching a lot of documentaries on the topic, as I was sort of mentioning earlier. I was kind of an armchair researcher in high school. Never got out in the field. You know, I was that some blogs were big in like the 2000s. So that's kind of where where I was uh, getting a lot of that content from reading people like Lauren Coleman, Crypto Mundo, the blog scene kind of did, lost my interest in the topics a little bit, you know, school and other things going on in life. But once I got out, that's when I sort of was like, hey, you know, I like making films. Why don't I just start doing it about some of these cryptids? And then that, they kind of evolved from, you know, doing that. And then I, I had a big interest, obviously, in the outdoors. And, uh, you know, I, I've hiked a lot and I, I did some survival training back in the day and naturalism program when I was in high school. It really kind of taught me love for the outdoors and just uh, kind of combined all of them. And, and that sort of inspired me to, to start doing you know field work and, and filming out there as well and trying to be as... Um, as involved as possible with some of that stuff. And I guess what keeps me going or what inspires me is honestly at the moment, probably the, some of the locations, just as I mentioned with one of my earlier answers to one of the other questions was just some of these locations are just unbelievable. Like whether yeah. it's Alaska or, or Utah or California, Colorado, Florida, New Hampshire, Maine, they're so incredible. I mean, I, I wish people could s just see some of these places and we really try to bring people along for the ride. And so that in turn, kind of, I've gotten so many comments from folks that say, Hey, we live kind of vicariously through your adventures, or we enjoy seeing what you guys are up to. It really kind of inspires us to get out there. That actually inspires me because I'm, if any, if, if the takeaway from all this stuff, you know, even if you believe in Bigfoot or not, I, it doesn't matter. If you see one of our films and say, I want to go hike out there. You know, if you're going to do it in a safe manner and that's going to make your life better, that's awesome. And I am all for that. <laughs> I mean, that that's definitely a big inspiration for me Yeah. and just the positive reception we've gotten. And, you know, even some of the criticisms like but uh, just hearing that people are inspired to get out there because of what we do is like, OK, this is great. I mean, that that inspires me to keep going for sure. And then, of course, when you have something interesting happen, it, it most of the time nothing happens. But that small percentage when something does that keeps me going. That definitely keeps me inspired as well. Yeah. Yeah. Get the little breadcrumbs going. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all right. I got two more here. Uh, the relic finder over on Instagram asked, uh, people make sounds, uh, for Bigfoot to return to an area. I assume they're talking about like wood knocks or vocalizations. Yeah. Um, and they're asking here, would yelling out, hello or you know something in english have the same effect as a wood knock or doing a whoop or something like that yeah it's an interesting question i mean there's obviously a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about whooping and wood knocking and it's some people think it's stupid some people think it's great i think it's stupid sometimes i think it's great sometimes <laughs> we've had i mean because the thing is if you're in a big wooded area thousands millions of acres you're you're searching for a needle in a haystack so let's say you do you do a wood knock or a whoop and something responds and it, it draws something in curiosity wise. Hey, that's great. You know, most of the time you do it, nothing happens, but the times where it does happen, it's like, okay, that's when you're kind of in a shot in the dark situation. But when you're in more of an area that maybe has a history of sightings, you look for other, other things. But um, I have heard of people, you know, getting, you know, a lot of these so, so, so kind of so-called habituation areas where they, they claim that there's a lot of activity, a lot of times, or they have Sasquatch on their property, whatever the case may be that they uh, they begin conversing with these things in plain English or, you know, whatever it is they may be saying. And I've heard of the stories of mimicking, you know, English. I've heard of people saying something mimicking them calling their dogs coming from the woods, you know, essentially oh. something something will call their dogs in the way that they call their dog, but almost like, uh, you know, kind of somebody impaired might say it, you know, it's kind of doesn't sound the same and the dogs are kind of confused. So 
Um, I've heard people claim that Bigfoot know how to speak English. I mean, I've yeah. kind of heard all, all those <laughs> kinds of claims and you know, whether or not that's the case, obviously, I don't know. I mean, I think it's interesting, but yeah, I mean, there, there's honestly been times where like at Bluff Creek, one of the areas we were in where there was something in the woods right there. We were sitting out there for an hour in the middle of the road after everyone left and something would sl- shuffle and move. And I mean, I got so frustrated at one point I said, hello, we know you are there whatever it was, you know, maybe it was a, an elk. I don't know, but it was staying super still and it would only move every 10 minutes and you just knew something was there. And I, I just started speaking English to it. And I think Eli and some of the guys were like really freaked out by that. Cause they're like, we were thinking in the back of our heads, this thing was just going to say hello or, you know, respond. And right. English, oh man. Which is funny, but imagine? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, we, yeah. we've, scream, we've screamed obscenities in the woods. We've done other silly stuff, just yeah. having fun because a lot of times you're just, you're trying to have fun and unorthodox methods might work at times, you know? So that's an idea. Definitely. Yeah, fair point. Um, <laughs> or even, even if you're going into an area, maybe that you're going into a lot that you think that there may be activity, just kind of making your presence known, you know, hello, I'm, I'm here now or whatever. Um, seems like these things can sense people's intentions, at least from reports. And that's like a, you know, a dog comes up to a person and, and, you know, they're either really like them or not because they can sense something that we can't, you know, it's not tangible. They're just, they have that kind of good instinct. I think these things probably like many animals probably can sense that in humans. That's not super. I mean, maybe that is supernatural. I don't know, but it's like an explainable kind of phenomena. Right. So yeah, possibly uh, we'll start talking to them and, you know, treat them like Harry from Harry and the Hendersons. I don't know. Maybe (laughs) maybe we'll try that. Yeah. Yeah. A good question for sure. (laughs) All right. Uh, One last audience question here comes from our good buddy, Jeremiah over at Bigfoot oh, awesome. Society. He says, uh, <laughs> when is beyond the beard oil coming out? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good idea. I may steal that idea. That would be really cool. Yeah, no, we, we're hoping to do some beyond Bigfoot Beyond the Trail merch, that sort of stuff. And just there want to have go. some cool shirts and stickers because, you know, we've got a lot of the, the STM has a lot of, you know, other stickers and stuff like that. But I think we need to, we need to work on that. And, uh, just, just cool. Cause I mean, I'm wearing a Bigfoot mapping project shirt right now. And Scott over there, uh, who's awesome, does some really great designs. And it has, I would check out, I recommend checking out the Bigfoot mapping project as a side note, just in terms right of on. sightings and really cool stuff. But yeah. just having cool stuff like that. I mean, I, people ask us all the time and we're like, we're working on it. Trust me. We want to, <laughs> we want to get something. We're hopefully going to get a DVD and that sort of thing. All the collections of different episodes and, that sort of thing too. But that beard oil would be a great idea. I mean, definitely, <laughs> definitely would be a cool one. I don't know how to go about getting that to happen, but uh, I'm sure I'm sure we could figure it out. Oh yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Jer- Jeremiah is awesome too. Definitely check out. <laughs> yeah. Shout out. Society. <laughs> he does good work for sure. Um, all right. Well, my, my final question here that I always ask my guests uh, when they come on the show is uh, in the wide world of uh, 40 and topics, what keeps you, up at night the most oh man geez you you know honestly i usually fall asleep pretty hard because i'm a night owl and i I go to bed really tired so there's not a lot but uh (laughs) i don't know i i don't get a lot of people get really freaked out going out into the woods at night and at this point we're just so used to it and and um not a lot of that kind of stuff unless i'm solo that is a little freaky but uh i don't know i think Maybe the excitement, you know, before we're about to embark on a trip, like before Alaska, you know, it's that kind of childish feeling of, you know, you're really excited for the first day of school, maybe not, but in some (laughs) cases, but you know, like something cool, like the Christmas morning, right? It's that sort of feeling where you can't sleep. So it's not necessarily freaky, but uh, I think that's what kind of will keep me up at night at certain times. But generally, I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to make it seem like I'm not scared of anything, (laughs) but there are, there, you know, when you're in the woods, there are certain things that are, uh, you know, you have to avoid obviously situations with unpleasant things like wildlife or, or strange people, that sort of thing. Um, but as long as you're responsible and you're able to calculate your risks, I don't think it should keep you up at night, but there are some creepy cryptid stories out there, but I don't like to think about them too hard at night. So <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't have there that problem. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right on. Well, um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, can you tell my audience where they can find you on yeah. online? For sure. Probably the easiest place would be petakovmedia.com. So that's P-E-T-A-K-O-V 
media.com, all one word. Um, that's just my website. It's got links to all of the stuff I've talked about, all my previous films, obviously all the Beyond the Trail episodes, uh, radio shows, other stuff I've been on. Um, I've got a shop. I sell some stuff in there as well. Slav Squatch stickers, other things, um, just sort of little things like that. That's probably the easiest place to find links to everything. But you could also go to the Small Town Monsters website uh, or the Small Town Monsters YouTube channel because uh, our our video is big for Beyond the Trails primarily on um, the YouTube channel. Uh, so that's those are probably the easiest places to find everything. Like I said, my website's probably the prim- primary one. It's got links to pretty much everything I've discussed. So right on, yeah. right on. And you also have your own YouTube channel too, right? Uh, Sasquatch yes. out of the shadows, right? <laughs> yeah. Sasquatch out of the shadows. I did a, a live stream for two years on there. Um, talking about Bigfoot and all sorts of stuff. And I'll put other videos. We did a lot of like, we do recaps of beyond the trail episodes, expeditions, that kind of stuff. Just having fun. I don't, I don't you do the, the live stream as regularly anymore, but um, I still like, I, I'm going to be doing one here soon and uh, sporadically. So uh, that's also all linked on, on my website too. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, thanks again for hanging out with me tonight, Alex. And, um, for, uh, Patreon members, uh, we're going to hang out for a little while longer keep talking about cryptids and, uh, high strangeness wherever that may lead us. So thank you again, everyone for checking out the show and, uh, we'll catch you next time. All right. Well, that was a real fun interview with Alex, and I hope you all enjoyed it. I've been wanting to have him come on the show for a while to talk about Bigfoot, Sasquatch, uh, because cryptids are a thing I cover, of course, but I I don't really talk about the big guy all that much, um, come to think of it. I suppose I I did an episode early on on the show about the Mogollon monster, which apparently it's pronounced Mogollon, not Mogollon. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe someone can correct me on that or not. People are funny. Uh, a couple months back, I posted a short video um, on the Mogollon monster and people, and I was pronouncing it Mogollon and people are like, no, it's Mogollon. That's how you pronounce it. And there's this other video I did about, um, Tessie from Lake Tahoe and I'm from new England. So I pronounce, uh, (laughs) I pronounce the state it's from, uh, like, uh, Nevada, not apparently how it's supposed to be pronounced, which is Nevada. (laughs) And people are still leaving comments uh, to this day saying you're pronouncing it wrong. So there you go. Anyway, you can check out Alex's website, petikovmedia.com. I'll drop the link in the show notes as always. Uh, Show him some love and support and uh, definitely go check out his films and uh, all the stuff he's involved with. We got to support our people that go out in the field with this stuff and and go boots on the ground and and get dirty. (laughs) All right, so cool news. Uh, Before we sign off for today, uh, the podcast just hit 30,000 downloads, which is wild. Uh, So thank you all for listening to my show, sharing it with your friends and family, and showing me all the support that you've shown over the, uh, we're coming up almost to two years of doing this show. Um, and it means so much to me and it's always appreciated and always keeps me going. I love talking about this stuff and it helps to have an, an audience of people that <laughs> really enjoy what I'm doing. So, uh, I think I'll probably do a giveaway soon to celebrate that milestone. So definitely stay tuned for that. If you're looking to support Strangeology, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash Strangeology to become a member. I offer a variety of tiers with different perks like shout outs, early access to new episodes, access to the Patreon exclusive episode extension, Strangeology Beyond, which is sometimes a whole episode itself. You also get VIP room access over on the Strangeology Discord exclusive merch, merch discounts, a home state cryptid of the month t-shirt club if you want to go with that tier, and more. Uh, Always looking to add new perks as well. So a big thank you to all of my patrons past and present. You're all amazing. 
and Strangeology wouldn't be able to function at the level it does without your support. So thank you so much. And again, that's patreon.com forward slash Strangeology. The other way you can support Strangeology is to head on over to my shop, strangeology.etsy.com. I have over 200 listings there of cryptid and Fortean themed merch from t-shirts, tank tops, sweatshirts, long sleeves, hoodies, to stickers, enamel pins, mugs, prints, and even blankets. <laughs> I'm always adding new designs over there. I recently finished up my Homestake Cryptids collection which is all available on apparel. And I think I've got most of the stickers up there. I'm periodically adding other designs as time goes on. And I'll probably revisit some states in the future because each state has like 50 cryptids. <laughs> so it's an ongoing process, but I wanna try and do some stuff branching out to other countries. I do have a Nessie design up in the shop that I put up a few months ago, but yeah, I'm hoping to expand a little bit more uh, around the world for for that collection. And as far as the Homestate Cryptids go, I am planning on doing a listing for regional sticker packs. So you could get like all the designs that are from the Northeast US or the Midwest or the, uh, the Atlantic states or the Pacific Northwest, that kind of thing. So be on the lookout for that. It'll probably take me a little bit to put it all together, but I've had also a lot of requests for like postcard uh, versions of my designs. So hopefully I can get around to doing something like that soon. I think the only postcard I have in the shop is for my uh, greetings from Roswell design that has the, uh, the Roswell uh, UFO crash, <laughs> which is a fun design. But anyway, thanks for checking it out. Your support is appreciated as always. And again, that's strangeology.etsy.com. And if you haven't done so yet, definitely give me a follow over on social media. You can find me on Instagram, which is always kind of like my main base of operations for socials. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you have any kind words or suggestions, you can always DM me on Instagram. You can also head over to my website, strangeology.com. You can sign up for my mailing list there uh, for some occasional merch discounts or updates. And you can also shoot me an email through my contact page as well if you have any suggestions or anything like that. And one final thing before I close out today's episode, if you listen to this show on Apple Podcasts, I always appreciate a nice review. It helps the show out a lot if you rate and review it. And I very much appreciate your constant support. All right. Well, that's it for me. Thanks again, everybody, for checking out today's episode. For members, stick around after the short break. Alex had a little bit of more time to hang out and tell some stories which were pretty interesting if I do say so myself. And it involves hanging out in my home state and experiencing some weird stuff out in the wilderness. So until next time, as I always say, take care of yourselves and each other and keep it strange.
All right, welcome back, Patreon members, to Strangeology Beyond. Uh, thanks again, Alex, for.